Hello dear ones, it's Alice. I am of the stars. The topic for today is the subconscious taboos of others that are the landmines of the telepath's existence. There is an ascension gift uh, to be able to look into a person's soul and know the very deepest secrets of a person's soul. I don't know that this Claire ability has been gifted with a name so far, so I will call it Claire Knowledge of Souls. This ascension gift can be either positive or negative, and resoundingly so. So it could be considered an ascension drawback in one sense and, and an ascension gift in another. And it all depends on the positive or negative nature of the perception of the other person's soul, you see. Um, so this is quite a weighty topic. I remember at the very beginning, from the very beginning, I had this this quality during the ascension process of being able clearly to see the greatest secrets of another person's soul. This has to do with yoga and the development of the third eye point most likely, or maybe higher, maybe the crown chakra or higher, or all the higher chakras. So as we begin to develop those chakras through the practice of yoga, or through other methods of, of honing our awareness, the, the issue of knowing other people's secrets, whether very good or very bad, comes up. I remember when I, when I first began the ascension process, I got in terrible hot water over this because I was meditating with a group of people who had a very big secret and that secret was buried in their subconscious minds and when I looked at them that secret would leap out at me and as I became aware of it they became aware that I knew about it. Do you see? In the particular instance in question it's it's so amazing you're going to have trouble wrapping your mind around it. Um, it seemed to me that that the leader, the, the original founder of that group, was an intersex person or hermaphrodite who had presented himself to the world as a man who had gone to great lengths to cover up the fact that his physical shape and his psychological attributes were very different from those presented to the world. And as fate would have it, over time the secret came out in the inner circle of this meditation group and many people who were also intersex people or hermaphrodites from all over the world would come to that place and become members of it. So amongst the people in the meditation group there was a memory of someone that they greatly revered, their founder, who had this secret. And there was also a contingent of people who had this same quality and this same secret. Um, a complicating factor was that this, the secret was so greatly buried in their minds that it created a kind of black magic effect that pursued the person who discovered it. They were known all over the world as being black magic people because of this. The, the cause of the black magic had to do with the darkness of the secret, not with the strength. Military groups and secret services around the world sometimes side with groups who have psychic powers that are ne negatively aspected. This has to do with the mission of military and secret services to protect their countries from territorial aggression. And so 
they have an inclination towards power over, you know, defensiveness, and it seems to them that it might be possible to harness, for instance, black magic or negatively aspected psychic superpowers to protect their nations. Well, protection of nations is a really important aspect of life on Earth. Of, of course, there is the question whether condoning black magic or negatively aspected psychic superpowers will help achieve this goal. It's my feeling, my hunch, that the exact opposite will occur, that nations that kowtow to black magic will fall. Uh, they will fall to nations that, that espouse family values, that, that stand for the high principles such as truth and justice and uh, happiness for their people, you know. It's, I've never known black magic to bring happiness to anyone or my feeling about it that it's, it's a wrong call for a nation to choose black magic as its guiding light. Secret services and military all over the world are known for um, revering uh, negatively aspected psychic superpowers. So therefore I had a concern on a, many different levels about getting away from this meditation group, those people. And, and in addition, there was the, 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 the story on the astral plane that no one had ever escaped them and that all the people had been driven mad or driven to suicide or murdered by assassins from the group and so forth these ideas and that only later I found only one other person had made it through and no one dare mention this thing and so forth. So uh, I'm still alive and that other person is still alive and I think the people themselves have become after 25 years less secretive about their secret and so that's a good thing. But it's the very first example of the ascension gift of awareness of other people's deep soul values. And what leaps out is pretty dangerous to the ascensioneer, okay? It can, it can compromise your life. On the other hand, it can be a very good thing because as we look at people, we're walking down the street, we know immediately this man is carrying a gun he intends harm, or he, he has, or he's angry, he has a violent disposition, or w whatever dangers await us, we're, we're very aware of them, more aware than most people. So, so two things happen. One is that people don't like us because we know their secrets, and they do go to great lengths to alienate other people from us for that reason. And two is that we can stay alive because we can avoid these kinds of people. I have to say I'm very grateful for the second quality, the one that allows me to stay alive because there are many, many amongst my light worker friends who during the ascension process have lost form for lack of that, uh, for lack of that attribute. It's a dangerous place, this reality is a dangerous place and that, that attribute is in, intended by our Ascension team to allow us to, to stay alive. Now, I have to go back to the first thing, the thing that makes people shun us. Last night I was watching a movie called Skam, Skamarens Dattar. It means The Shamer's Daughter. It, it's from a book called, by Lene Kaberal. It has to do with a tradition, in an old Norse tradition, of seeking out women who had this ascension ability to, to see deeply into the souls of other people. And those women were used as, as, as judges and peacekeepers to, to find the true worth of a person's soul, and in a particular instance, to settle issues that might otherwise result in war. 
Sometimes they were very successful at this. A shamer was someone who, sh who saw the shame in other people. And so the other people who were viewed, psychically viewed by the shamer, felt ashamed. Okay. And that's the same gift as I've been speaking to you about of awareness of other people's souls. Um, but the interesting thing about the book and the movie is that the emphasis is completely on the hidden psychological secret that's considered to be extremely bad to be a boo. So over the years, what has happened with regard to this Ascension gift is that I've run into person after person on the psychic plane and on the physical plane who has a deep, dark secret. In fact, I'd be inclined to say every person on Earth has a deep, dark secret. Okay? And, and those people are so intent on no one knowing about that that the minute that I see that secret and they become aware that I know about it, they they take a dislike to me, you know. And, and then after a while when I think about these people, the first thing that pops into the, my mind is their extreme negative response to me because I know their secret. And also popping into my mind is their secret, which is, you know, bad to say the least because the more I think of those people on the psychic plane, the more I think about their big dark secret and the worse their antagonism towards me gets on the subconscious plane, even from afar. In a way, you could say that their negative subconscious state of mind with regard to this awful thing, whatever it is, um, over the many intervening years has influenced me to the negative too, because the first thing I think about when I think about people is their secret, the secret they don't want anyone to know. You know, and that's bad. This morning I was looking into the psychological principle of substitution and my idea was this. I remember the Native Americans, the first peoples of America. They got around all this um, by naming people a certain name that expressed one of their finest qualities. It might be, yeah, it might be running deer, someone who was very fleet of foot. It might be the e eyes of the eagle, someone who had very sharp eyesight. It might be, you know, it might be the wise owl. It might be uh, the gentle rabbit. It, you know, they, they would think up something that, that expressed the soul qualities of the person that are very positive, some very good quality. And they would call them by that name every time time they thought of them or saw them. So the Native Americans, the first peoples, thought of a way to strengthen the positive um, subconscious cohesiveness of their tribe by expressing the positive soul qualities of each person in the tribe. And I thought that might work for me. You know, I can come up with something that strikes me as the most wonderful um, quality of each of these people with the deep dark secrets and all the people that don't have deep dark secrets and every time I think of them every time I telepath with them every time I see them in my mind I can say for instance he who makes friends easily She who studies hard. He who teaches courage. She of the sharp and lively wit, and so forth, things like that. I could come up with a, a nickname for everybody that's very, very positive. And in that way, I might rewire for my own sake this negative conditioning that's been occurring uh, with regard to other people 
and begin to, to see everyone else in a very positive sense. I did some research this morning on the substitution effect, and it's kind of tangential, in fact, very, but it's very interesting. One interesting thing that I found out is that there's a negative su substitution effect that's recognized to occur when an organization or an area of study rushes to substitute its own expertise for the native ability of the people that it's trying to help. This might happen in a developing country, for instance, uh, where people from a developed country rush in and, and assume that the people there have no resources when in fact they may have resources in place. And these people uh, from the developed countries um, sort of keelhaul the structure that's in place in the country and perhaps the culture and trample on the people's feelings by by substituting their own goods and systems for the goods and systems in place for the people. Um, that reminded me of the modern discipline of psychology, which I feel, oh, and, and also to a certain extent Western medicine, which seemed to ramrod about and assume that a patient that comes to them is ill and is in need of help rather than approaching, in the case of psychology, a positive mentoring um, attitude to help a person to regain or restore their psychological health. In other words, it's a labeling process imposed from the outside on people who might otherwise think uh, well of themselves. They might, because of a positive attitude towards themselves, um, heal more quickly, psychologically, you know. In a way that's similar to the developed countries moving into the developing countries with aid responses that ignore the local structures in place. It tramples on people's self-respect, you know. Um, and then with regard to modern medicine, in the case of light workers, you know, we have many clear abilities. So in India in ages past, certain of the light worker abilities were acknowledged among as cities that spiritual powers or psychic powers amongst the spiritual elite of India. And so these qualities have been known for a long time. Um, one of them is the ability to alter bodily functions. And one of those functions that can be altered is blood pressure. And another is the rate of the heartbeat. And then there's physical temperature that can be altered and a respiration can be stopped or started up again. In fact, there are stories about people in India who were buried alive and stopped breathing for 500 years and then their hibernating bodies were uncovered and they began breathing again, you see. So there are many things unacknowledged by Western medicine that were acknowledged to be possible in ancient India and still are today. As these were acknowledged as psychic abilities, and these the light workers call ascension gifts, because of the fact that all humankind is beginning to uh, receive and and actualize these gifts. Uh, I remember in the early days when I was practicing with that meditation group, the one with many psychic abilities, the one that you know began to dislike me intensely. <laughs> <laughs> that one, that many uh, special psychic effects occurred. For instance, I could sit in meditation for a day or two and barely breathing or not at all and still come back to awareness the same as I was when I started out the meditation. So the fact that I wasn't breathing during that time, it's acknowledged in India, but in modern medicine they might call that uh, an illness, you know? It's very helpful if you're in the ocean and you can't breathe, not to have to breathe, don't you think? But 
uh, in everyday life, if you stop breathing, uh, then people people start pointing their, you know how it is. And so if you want to practice that technique of breathlessness, it's good to go to a very quiet place, a place where you feel safe and where other people won't see you or discover you until you stop doing that, I feel. It's a very restful effect. And it's, it's good for the self-respect to be able to do things that many other people aren't able to do. It helps us leap out of the mold of the reality as it's perceived by many people and into a new world, a new life on new earth, you know. It, it, it helps us to understand that miracles are possible, that we can create reality, that we can we can optimize reality and that we ourselves have free will and the power to do all this through God's grace here on earth, you know, informed by the abilities sent down to us from the divine through our ascension team, we can accomplish many things on earth, a lot more than they say on the TV sitcoms, many, many more. We can completely transform reality, you know. It's hard to aver this day after day when we're confronted by, by the social conditioning of limitation. So by lack of limitations, by becoming aware of our ascension gifts, we can overcome negative conditioning that unfortunately exists in our culture today. So to get back to light workers and ascension gifts, um, there's also an issue of very great sensitivity of light workers. For instance, I have the gift of electromagnetic sensitivity. You could say you could say the energy field of a human being, other human beings, and my own energy field. Now, the World Health Organization, last time I looked, they have a negative spin on this. They call it hypersensitivity to the electromagnetic force. They think of it as a disease. Now, this negative notion of the world towards our gifts of supersensitivity might be helpful to us in a, in a way because if what our gifts are is perceived by the world as negative, as a disease, then it's possible that we might get government money, you know, for this disease, you know. On the other hand, it's not so good because then we might begin to think of ourselves as damaged, damaged goods, you know. The next thing that I looked into this morning had to do with economics. And it's, it's a substitution uh, theory with regard to economics and changing prices in the market. And it's a sort of a wuss around topic because there's some people that say that as prices rise, then people can be okay with that because they look for cheaper goods and so they're happy anyway. And there's other people that say, well, on the other hand, if people can't afford anything, then that's a negative thing and substitution theory won't work in economics anymore. For instance, I'm looking at the housing market in Los Angeles in the last few years and my thoughts along those lines go like this. It's way too high. Okay. In addition, there's the cost of, of utilities, which is outrageous. Okay. So the money that people are capable of making can compare to the cost of living in Los Angeles, and this has been the case in the last few years. So the first thing I've noticed that my neighbors in my community have done is they've, they've been on a fixed income, say, or they've been unable to earn more at their jobs or they've lost their jobs and they want to keep their houses. They might try to take out home loans. They might... Uh, conserve water and electricity and gas. They might do their own home repairs. They might do their own home maintenance and 
eventually they might have their water turned off altogether or to the very lowest point where they can't even take a shower except once a month or they can only use water for drinking like that and then some financial catastrophe might occur where they they simply cannot make ends meet okay at that point they have two choices they can find an illegal way to make money I mean there are a million ways to do that they might try robbing houses for instance and the possibility is very great that they will end up in jail if they do that they might try rolling drunken people after after the bars close you know they might try holding up a bank there are a lot of wild schemes out there when people become so desperate that they simply cannot afford their home and they feel that the greatest good is to stay in their home and so we're running into many instances of people suddenly popping up violent maybe killing each other just because they're under such tension with regard to meeting their living expenses here in Los Angeles so the other thing that can happen is that a person can no longer afford the goods that have gone up in price a person can no longer for instance afford a home here in Los Angeles okay and then they have to move out of their home and then they have to figure out what to do next there are 75,000 homeless people here in Los Angeles right now and the question is what to do about it I have a question why we don't just lower the value of housing what stops that from happening what stops us from substituting a value that's affordable for everyone what's going on there and in the substitution process in the subconscious mind when we see other people's subconscious minds what is it that stops us from looking to the most positive secret thing in another person's soul and mind another theory that I ran across today has to do with um, the possibility that through substitution through mental substitution we can change our view of reality we can actually change what we perceive as reality by substitution now so over the years as a light worker what has happened for me isn't very good you know because popping up in people's subconscious minds is a very negative most awful thing that's ever occurred to them in their life they may have lived a very good life a very exemplary life because of this very thing because they made a decision at that point that they would never do such a thing again for all you know you know you know they can't tell the world about it but but it's positively affected the direction of their life so 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 my idea is we have to pick the positive thing instead we have to we have to find the positive thing it might not be their positive thing they might be dwelling on the negative thing but as light workers we have to look to the most positive thing in that person's soul awareness you know and substitute that so will this work I'm asking you will this work if we substitute he who runs like the deer she who who has laughter in her voice he who is a wise owl she who is gentle like the rabbit if we substitute that for these these awful negative things that are going on that are repressed and socially taboo in our own minds what will happen and the answer is it may change our own reality you know that's what I feel it may it may optimize our reality if we do this and it may get around all this this psychological mumbo-jumbo so that's what I'm going to try and I hope that that it 
has the desired effect and I thought I would let you all know because it could be that you're um, encountering the same types of troubles. Uh, I wish my fellow light workers the very best reception in the world because a positive impression upon the world to be completely open about it increases our chances of survival immensely, you know, so that we won't be known as the shamers' daughters. We'll be known as those who lift people up and bring them to awareness and and help them to achieve their potential of light, you know. And it will help in the meantime be our own outlook on life, I feel, and lift us up if we're able to look at the most positive thing in everybody who comes to us with their deepest, darkest, most awful stuff, you know. So the people approach us with a negative attitude on the telepathic plane and we substitute a positive thing. It may not change their awareness, but it, I feel it will change ours. So that's the message for today. Plenty of things to think about, and I wish you all the very greatest and the happiest and most inspired life that ever may be. May God bless you and keep you safe and be with you through all your days. In love, light, and joy, this is Alice B. Claggett. I am of the stars, and for sure you are too. See you at my website, Awakening with Planet Earth. What a topic, huh? The taboos, the social taboos that that are landmines of awareness, the social taboos of others that are the landmines of our progress through the third dimension. <laughs>